Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Ojele Siama, president of the ECEGSO. A couple of weeks ago, we conceived this idea, and I'm glad that today we're able to make it happen. We are looking to give our graduate students a unique opportunity to present their research in a very low stake environment, right? And so all the pressure of these conferences is off their shoulders, but it allow them to practice presenting the work that they've been done. And we're also giving the graduate, the undergrad students opportunity to take a look at what is happening. And so we hope that you all have a very good time. Uh, we are fortunate to have the EC Office of Student Wellbeing and Engagement here with us. We have our uh, head officer. Please give a round of applause. She's doing a very good job for us. We are going to, the Office of Student Wellbeing is going to award our top presenter $1,000 worth of travel grant. And so whoever is adjudged the best presenter for today's event be awarded this prestigious award. We have two judges helping us with us, Dr. Lashmi Raju and Dr. Reza. I'm going to give them a few minutes to share with us the criteria they're looking for um, in the presentations just before we begin. You can show your girl. <laughs> <laughs> so, we've been put on the spot a little bit here, but uh, this is really just a chance for the PhD students to practice their presentations, but also a chance to, um, I think as engineers, one thing that's very important is to be able to communicate the work that you do, not just to people in your own field, but to people in general. It's very important that the world can understand the importance of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And this is a chance um, to increase your communications in that aspect. And that has um, a lot of uh, areas of concern. So like making slides and graphics and visuals that make sense and not just, uh, you know, reading from your PowerPoint. So it's about your oral delivery, your visuals, um, and as well as the work itself. That's also important that you're doing work that's important and relevant. Uh, so I think that's what we're looking for. Thank you. I think you said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're very excited about this. Yeah. Thank you very much. And so, without further ado, we're going to take our first presentation. Um, Amanda West. Thank you. What was it ready? This is a clicker. Okay. Uh, okay. Hi, everybody, or good evening. My name is Amanda West, and today I'll present not a specific research project, but more so my thesis research in general to see so you all can see what field we're looking at in the electrical energy systems and energy equity as a small snippet of that field. So electrical energy systems, how do we consider equity? And this is my back like intro slide. I'm a fourth year PhD student in the Advanced Computational Electric Electricity Systems Lab led by Dr. Santiago Grijalva. I'm a, and currently pursuing my PhD. And I also got my BS from here. So kind of understand the struggle. <laughs> but yeah, so let's get into it. Uh, with electrical energy systems, we have kind of four main topics. We have production, and that's where you have your solar PV, batteries, wind, nuclear, uh, conventional generation, as well as hydroelectric, ways to generate power, that's production. We go into transmission, where you see those big poles on like uh, areas of land where it's kind of barren, all that transmission wire. There's also distribution poles, and um, this kind of nodal network represents a system connecting all that production into consumption, which are your homes, dishwashers, refrigerators, that's where you end use consumer energy, as well as EVs, which we'll get in with the next slide where you kind of have production and consumption on the same field. So currently we're in an energy transition. It's been driven by sustainability goals to combat climate change. And that's also fueled by the introduction of more distributed energy resources, which are like solar photovoltaics or battery energy storage. So they're distributed, they can go be in many places and they're energy resources. So that's distributed energy resources. And now with the prosumer, that's a name for kind of what that EV is. So an electric vehicle can be a prosumer because it's able to kind of produce energy. If it stores something, some energy that's charged with the battery, 
and is able to send that back to the grid or power home. Consider like the Ford F-150 Lightning. It's been marketed to be able to power a house in an outage. So that way it can do both, pr produce and consume energy. And the tr transition that we're looking at is this kind of traditional system where you have the utilities producing power and transmitting it to your demand or your consumers. That's radial. It's a large scale system with very few owners. Consider Georgia Power a Southern Company. They're a big monopoly for the whole Southeast region that's producing all this energy. And it's centrally governed. And we're moving into uh, an area where it's bi directional. So that two way arrow where we can produce and consume on the distribution level or transmission level scale. This allows bi directional, small scale generation with many small owners and local governments. So we're moving from this pretty big system where not many people can get in into another, a smaller scale, more distributed system where everyone can kind of jump in ad hoc. And this produces a lot of problems, but also more chances to engage. And one thing that I'm looking at is how do we ensure the transformation is equitable for all citizens? Let's talk about people kind of throw that word around a lot. So I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with this slide. Yeah, okay. So this is kind of a scaled down version of, of this where we're looking at a comparison between equality and equity. With equality, we provide everyone with a base level. That doesn't always cut it. You see some people can't see the ball game, right? So you want everyone to be able to see the ball game comfortably. So with equity, we're able to provide what each individual needs to be able to participate in the game or the system. And that's what I look at for energy equity with this de definition over there, where it's the fair distribution of benefits and burdens associated with the power system to all stakeholders. Stakeholders means anyone who's engaged in the system. We are all stakeholders here. The power company is a stakeholder. Everyone who interacts with energy is a stakeholder and should be heard in that system. And their basic ten tenets are, are here. I'm going to check the time just to make sure I'm okay. Yeah, look, you can read that. <laughs> so... So these are, we'll just gloss over procedural recognition and distribution of the basic tenets. And what my research looks at specifically is looking at that energy burden, which is the percentage of a person's income that they spend on energy. So if you make, let's say like $50,000 a year and you spend $2,000 on energy, that ratio is your energy burden. And the way that I address this here in ECE is looking at connecting the social economic and technical viewpoints to ensure the electricity system is equitable for all citizens. And I do this by looking at rate designs, so how much Georgia Power or another utility will charge you per kilowatt hour of energy that you purchase from them. Uh, looking at community microgrid models, which is designing a collection of DER resources to be able to provide power to different neighborhoods. And then looking at a quantitative assessment tool, development tool to assess how Introducing these DRs in a community can impact them on the long term and using control system fundamentals. Simple, and this right here is a definition of a microgrid in case you do not know that they are a uh, unit with defined boundaries, single controllable entity, and grid connected and islanded modes. And here, switching it on is grid connected, off is islanded, and it's all these different things that come together in a geographical region to be able to ensure there's power to that area if it's connected to the utility or not. And this enables economic empowerment as well as individual community resilience in the, in the event of an extreme weather event or something like that. For electricity rates, here's an example rate. I just wanted to put this up here in case you haven't looked at rates in a minute or ever. So here is what you would see when you pay your electricity and the rate is right here which is your current service bill per kilowatt hour and then the rest of it is just tariffs but the rates are the only thing that you can manage based upon your energy usage and there's a really big area to try to connect power systems optimization with the these designing of these rates to ensure that people's energy burdens minimize and ensure the system is more equitable. And for time, yeah. And for the hours, we're going to skip this slide for a second. So I wanted to kind of get to the control theory part because majority of my research isn't 
really based within ECE, but this portion is. Um, all of the search I've done more recently is in power systems, which is more economics as well as optimization, which is kind of held more so in ISYE. But when we look at trying to model community development, we're looking at this type of matrix where we're using control theory fundamentals to say that this will be the next state of a community given a matrix A times the previous state of the community. And the way that we're doing this is by using different types of factors, AIJs, which are just different ways you can evaluate different portions of the community. Say, for instance, how much money the community has, how many green spaces the community has. And we do that by kind of, this is a more direct visualization of it, where here's all these different portions, aspects of the community, and the different factors that go into each individual aspect, and then your current state. So we're developing this framework now to try to connect the control theory with community development, which is very much in the social science and kind of bridge that gap. And here's just kind of like a overview of different methods that go in, or yeah, methods that go into these different aspects of research. So for the microgrid modeling, I'm using the software tool, which is Julia, and there's a power models package for that. It's also open DSS is for the distribution system. For theory, I'm looking at optimization and economics with the rate planning. It's similar. I use Julia as well as Python for visualization. And there's a lot of census data manipulation within that. And then for a regeneration matrix, it's very heavy in the control theory and parameter estimation and model linearization. So I didn't want to go into all those details, but I wanted to like show you guys that area. This is the current status. Quickly looking at that and future work, we're just trying to improve each of those aspects. You know what the energy burden is for the average American? Like, just curious. Not directly off the top of my head, but from what I've looked at, it's generally between like two and six percent percent of your income. <laughs> but for areas where it's extremely burdened, the benchmark is at six percent, and there are some areas where it's like twenty percent. And that's not the average, but there are regions that have that type of burden. It's those regions that we're trying to reduce it for. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to identify a specific factor that has like a lot of weight, like the amount of green space in the community or something like that? Not yet. So at this point, we've only we've seen that if we increase add more factors, it helps us reach our like it helps uh, to reach the goals faster but not seeing a particular factor that weighs more heavily than others. And one of the challenges with the work is appropriately assigning weights because all of this, all of these details aren't kind of quantified at that level. So we're just taking a bunch of literature and assuming how the factors would relate to it. So that's something that we're kind of struggling with right now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So I guess I don't know anything about, I guess, control theory or like power and stuff. So like, as, as an outsider, what do you think I can take away from like your like, research in general? Like, are you going to help me like lower like the energy burden of my, uh, or are you going to try that if you're both like reduce the energy burden of the community um, or like are you know, ways to do that? Like, what is something that might be using power? Area. Yeah. yeah. So I understand. I also I just you know, I got it. So um I think one thing for my specific work to take away is exactly that. So my goal is to reduce people's energy burden. And to do that by using power systems and being able to create rates that are grounded in the physical power system, but also connecting the economics to it. So the goal is to pay less for your power, pretty much, but also make the utility happy because they need their money too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Gabriella up next.
Here? Okay. And then here I can put it this number. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending this presentation today. Um, I am Gabriela Sanchez, and I am a third year bioengineering PhD student, but I belong to the electrical and computer uh, to the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of like intro to, to me. I did, I am a biomedical engineer by training, but, um, and I did part of my bachelor's degree here at Georgia Tech and my specialization was medical imaging analysis and processing. And well, fun fact, I've met the King and Queen of Spain because I, I got a fellowship and they gave it up, but I think it's a fun fact. And that's my lab, um, here. And my presentation is going to be a little bit of the overview of my lab and to current ongoing, uh, projects. And well, I think the funniest uh, fact about me is that I was the EC meme competition winner for last year. Uh, I love this competition. They do it every year. Uh, I think we do a meme again. Uh, but yeah, okay. So my lab focus. My lab focus is actually on ocular woman's health. And that's my research focus as well. Because 55% of the people with vision loss, vision impairment are women. And so in our lab, we believe that there is a physiological and magnetic re uh, reason that this happens. And historically, women have been uh, neglected in research uh, in such a way that when they do animal experiments, they only use male rats. So we don't know what happens to female physiology. And so we think it's really important to look from a women's health perspective. And so in my lab, we have different research lines. One of them is finite element modeling. So we create computational models of anatomy and we do computational experiments. And then we actually have uh, experimental settings so that we can test all of these computational results in vivo uh, or ex vivo in animals. Uh, we also have a big research now line on deep neural networks and how we can use deep learning and artificial intelligence to uh, for early disease diagnosis and prevention. And finally, we have also been doing some work on genetic data mining. So how can uh, how do all of these changes that we identify through this method actually impact? Uh, how genes and proteins are expressed. And this is just a little bit of the lab. But today I'm going to focus on glaucoma. Glaucoma is a disease in which you eventually become blind. And so it is estimated that it will affect approximately 212 uh, uh, million people by 2040. So that's like two thirds of the United States going blind. Um, and well, uh, turns out that there's 59% of the people with glaucoma are women. So we believe, again, that there's like a physiological reason contributing to this. And so that's what we're looking at. So um, this is uh, what a person with glaucoma is a normal person, vision, and this is a person with glaucoma. So we, they start uh, losing peripheral vision in such a, until they're completely blind. And um, it seems that it's no big deal to lose peripheral vision but then simple obstacles can completely be ignored and it's very, very dangerous. The problem is like people will not know that they have glaucoma until it's very, very advanced. And once the vision is lost, we cannot recover that vision. Why? Well, it happens that if we look at the globe, uh, there's one layer called the retina. In the retina, there are multiple layers of cells, but the most important layer for glaucoma is here. It's called the retinal nerve fiber layer and it conveys the visual information from here to the brain. And so if these cells are dying, we can't, like that information is not getting to the brain, we're not able to create the picture, right? We're not able to see. And so because these cells die, the retina is going to become thinner and thinner. How do we see these, right? It's really hard, like we can't just open a person's eye, right? And so we, so we use something called optical coherence tomography, which is like ultrasound, but with light, we emit light pulses and we get uh, responses back. And this is, uh, no, it's called optical coherence tomography, OCT, and that's what we see. So you can see here, this layer of cells is this first layer here. 
And so with glaucoma, we're going to start seeing how the first layer decreases because these cells are dying and they're getting more. So, okay, all this bio background, what, why, right? Well, because that's where we as engineers come in play. Uh, we can target our early diagnosis in glaucoma if we can make better estimations of this layer thickness, right? And so actually this is traditionally done by doctors. So what they do is basically denote which layer is the, their retinal nerve fiber layer, the white layer, and the rest of the layers are all clustered in um, gray. Uh, gray mask. So this is where we can measure the thickness from this model. This is usually done by doctors or specialists, and it's very, very expensive because they're trained professionals. And this takes a lot of time. And humans are also moody. Like we get tired, we get in a bad mood, and the quality of our segmentation can decrease. So um, this can lead to like worse than glaucoma diagnosis. Um, so we would like to make it completely automated, right? That's engineer streams. Um, so what we did in this project is to generate, to first acquire these OTP images and then create our own database of these uh, bilayer segmented masks and train a convolutional neural networks to produce these segmentations. And um, we can, uh, you can ask me details about the, com the computational details later. And uh, we can see that our deep learning model, so this artificial intelligence model, did pretty well. So in a control eye, in a healthy eye without glaucoma, which is usually easier to segment, we can see that it does very close to the human annotator. This is the human, and this is uh, the machine. And in a glaucomatous eye, we can see that there are subtle differences, like in this center area. But over overall, it does a very good job. And it's pretty hard to like distinguish all the structures that we can see here uh, with uh, advanced damage. And um, well, we wanted to see if these are um, if these are actually uh, good in terms of like thickness, not only like visually uh, good segmentations. And so we went ahead and measured and took OCT images of rats of control rats here at dashed and rats with glaucoma here with a solid line. And so we uh, measured the thickness from those segmentations at different time points. And we can see that uh, in the control rats and in the optic nerve crash rats, there's a decrease in thickness. So the algorithm is able to detect the, the thickness change because of glaucoma. And um, this uh, applies the same as the total thickness and retinal nerve fiber thickness. So the white layer and the total, the white and gray layer that we saw. And so then we wanted to see if we could take this a step further and use multiple, um, multiple layers of the retina. So we train a human annotator to segment all the layers of the retina, not only the retinal nerve fiber layer, and see if with this uh, we could produce also accurate maps. And it turns out that we can produce accurate maps. Um, and so this is still ongoing, but this is the progress we've gotten so far. Uh, and this is one of the segmentations, and you can see that it's even more sensitive to human annotators, to textural changes. So these are good news. Maybe we find further differences in other layers, um, not only the first layer, to assess global. And so uh, very briefly, I'm just going to overview uh, another project that I've been doing, which uh, deals with generative AI. So basically what happens is when a patient has glaucoma, they have glaucoma in both eyes, and they arrive when the damage is already very advanced. So how did that patient look two years ago? We don't know. We don't know how much it has been generated. So we have a database comprised of three different diseases that are not glaucoma. Okay, we can call them A, B, and C. And this time we have 84,000 images. So it's a much larger database because our previous database, we crafted ourselves and it was 200 images. Um, and so we want to see if using generative AI, we can create normal healthy images from those deceased images. And so we can say, oh, so this is how the patient is now, but this is how the patient looked uh, two years ago. And so by training on these diseases, we can identify um, these uh, disease features. So we can see, oh, this region changed a lot. Oh, this other region that didn't change that much. And so uh, we can not only diagnose early, but also identify pathological features. Um, that have changed in our retina with disease. And while well, we're testing it with glaucoma images, so we don't really know how it looks yet, but maybe I'll tell you next year, who knows? And so 
well, what happens is that we have all of these models, but now what happens? Um, well, it turns out that in PubMed, a medical, uh, a medical web page to search for papers, the amount of deep learning and AI papers has spiked. But now one publishes those models, or if they do, they're in Python. Do you think that doctors know Python? Do you think that clinicians know Python? They do not. Um, so it's, we believe in our lab, it's very important to pass these models onto uh, like uh, interfaces that are able to communicate with physicians. And so that's where, um, well, they get really excited about them. <laughs> but um, that's where we need you. My lab is actually uh, recruiting for undergrad students that wanna learn about deep learning and put deep learning models into interfaces that can help us interact with clinicians, researchers, and reach to more people. And make this research truly really And that was it, thank you. And I'll answer any questions if you guys have. I guess I don't know much about glaucoma. Like, uh, why is it uh, impossible to reverse it when it's like at a later stage? But like, like I guess at an earlier stage, it's easier to like clear up. No, so you're never gonna get back your vision, but because the cells die. You know, the cells are dead. They do not regenerate. They're part of the central nervous system. And so it doesn't uh, it doesn't create more cells. So once you lose those cells, you're never going to get it back. But the problem is that the more you, the more cells you lose, the worse that you're going to see. What we can do is actually stop it early. And so, so if we stop it early, you might have lost 20% of your vision, but you will not lose more with treatment. So we're stopping it. So that's why it's really important to diagnose thoroughly. Did most of the images come from, like the images in the database come from like the testing apparatus that you showed? From a what? The te did the images come from the testing apparatus that you showed? Yes. So it, it was like in-house, mainly like, Okay. Yes, we take these images in lab, everything in lab. We have the rats in lab, we take the images with the machine in lab. And uh, that's the in-house tool that we've created. And so this, is there going to also be some, like, for other traditional databases where it's, like, applied to human studies? Yeah, I think so. So that once we create, once we develop this tool that allows more people to interact with it, we can just use um, other, we can use images from, like, other animals. We can use images from humans and see how it performs. But uh, right now, it's just myself. And that's more part of my thesis. And so uh, we've I, we've only tested it in rats and mice, but it works for both. So I'm hopeful. Uh, I have a question. So glaucoma, I know, is associated with increased intraocular pressures. Um, is that something that they can do, like in clinics, or like when you go to see the doctor? How does that compare to like? Um. So some types of glaucoma are related to intraocular pressure. So intraocular pressure is the only thing that we know for sure leads to glaucoma. But there are certain types of glaucoma where you don't have intraocular pressure and you still get blind. Um, so they do look for intraocular pressure when you go get an eye exam, but that's not fully orientative. So if you have really high pressure, they're going to put you on medication for glaucoma. But if you have low pressure, you can still have low. And so they still need to assess with those teeth uh, to see if those like cells are still there. Any other questions? Yes, uh, I'm just curious, like, so how does research how I really see, like, other than like, other than what? Other than like, imaging. Well, uh, all the deep learning model part is easy, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Well, where do you draw? I mean, where do you draw the line? I don't know. I think I think it has well a big part of math, 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 machine learning, mathematical math, machine learning optimization, and all of those are embedded within the deep learning models. I've just shown here the application, um, but I could also show the more of the computational details, I guess. Sort of um, background or steps would be like to look into the one of our projects. So which steps? Um, so I think the first step will would be like understanding the model, how to pre-process the images, 
how to feed them to the model and get the output. And then maybe get familiar with, um, there's there's different distributions. So there's one possible distribution that people do with web pages. So that would be um, more like front end web page developing. And the other would be like image J. So that's more in Java. So getting familiar with Java and getting and knowing how to develop a plugin for something for people. So it would depend because um, yeah, we're very open lab. Um, you can like if you want more information, you can send me an email. Right. Yeah. Um, Yeah, 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 I think it's Right now, it, it's. I, I think it, it doesn't show this one. Yeah. yeah. Put it on the extended desktop, and you always learn something. Yeah, that that's that's perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was last bit. Nothing wrong with it. Um, I think I will just use laptop. I'm not good at this. <laughs> Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Said. I'm a fifth year uh, PhD student in ECE, and, and I work with Dr. Levante Gertekin. And today I will be uh, presenting my uh, PhD work, uh, Targeted Direct Delivery in the Brain Using Transcranial Focused Ultrasound. So millions of people in the United States suffer from neurological disorders, uh, mainly Alzheimer's disease and brain tumors. Um, uh, many drug delivery attempts failed due to blood-brain barrier. And what is blood-brain barrier? Uh, this barrier basically keeps harmful substances out from our brain, and uh, it basically controls uh, what enters and exits our brain. And, and meanwhile, doing this uh, function, it also prevents drug delivery uh, in, the, in the brain tissue. Uh, the reason is that uh, the, the certain uh, the, the size of the molecules can't go through that blood-brain barrier, and I believe uh, to open blood-brain barrier and to deliver drug uh, in the brain, uh, we, we should be utilizing a transcranial ultrasound. More specifically, um, focusing ultrasound beam in a targeted region and then stimulating uh, blood-brain barriers open uh, the blood-brain barriers temporarily. And, and, and non-invasively. As you see in the animation, uh, injected blood, uh, in, injected uh, marker bubbles in the bloodstream uh, sonicated externally, and then uh, listening them and then adjusting the son sonication level basically uh, allows us to uh, deliver drug in the brain. And one of the main components of this uh, therapy uh, marker bubbles, uh, they are basically gas-filled structures and when we excite them uh, in a certain frequency, they uh, emit different frequencies. For instance, uh, in, in, in this uh, figure, when we excite marker bubbles with the F, F, F0 frequency, they generate different harmonics. The uh, basic, uh, the, the, the unique uh, harmonics tells us how marker bubbles uh, act, uh, how marker bubbles, um, the basically the dynamics of the marker bubbles. And so that we can adjust or we can uh, basically stimulate microbubbles in a certain region 
so that they, they won't be uh, exploded and then damage the, the tissue. And, and this is the treatment cycle. To understand micro bubbles better um, and the treatment, uh, initially the micro bubbles and the drug injected in the bloodstream and then external uh, sonication is started. And when we start uh, sonication, we also start listening them and then to capture those uh, unique harmonics. And uh, capturing those harmonics basically allows us to adjust the sonication level so that we can keep marker bubbles in the, uh, in the stable cavitation, uh, which basically open the blood barrier, barrier uh, effectively. So basically, so far we go over uh, some of the uh, the basic and and what we need for a system which can do blood brain barrier. Uh, and first, they need a certain pressure level to activate uh, micro bubbles. And secondly, uh, we need a wide frequency frequency bandwidth to excite and to receive a micro bubble emission in 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 the therapy. So in, in currently, uh, there are different um, number of uh, systems and uh, some of them are hemispherical and some of them are single elements. However, they have, they, they have a, a common uh, limiting factor, which are uh, having a narrow bandwidth and fixed uh, frequency selection and limited number of, um, uh, number of elements basically limits the therapy for more um, FDA approved um, the procedure. So although uh, the current system can generate a sufficient pressure, uh, again, as we discussed, they have a limited bandwidth, which basically limits the therapy. And my, th my PhD thesis uh, based on uh, if we can overcome these limitations. And which brings us a uh, capacity micro machine ultrasonic transducers. And uh, these transducers are a novel, uh, the, the, the ultrasonic transducers. And they fabricated in 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 Calurium facility, which is the same as uh, your uh, cell phone chips uh, are fabricated. And in basically in micro micro level, um, they have two uh, electrodes. While the bottom electrode is fixed, the top electrode uh, moves under the uh, electrode electrostatic actuation, and then uh, they can generate and they can receive the ultrasonic wave. And the, my uh, my thesis, uh, the the objective is that using those um, capacity micro machine ultrasonic transducers or CMOTs for a transcranial uh, direct delivery system. So we start um, our experiment with characterization, and uh, the the CMOT under this experiment setup uh, characterized by the in impulse um, uh, impulse function, then uh, to understand the wide frequency uh, operation. And this basically uh, gives us the idea that we can operate this CMOT in, in a wide frequency bandwidth from the, the, the figure on right. And then secondly, um, after we do transcript uh, the characterization, uh, we start uh, the, the receive experiment. Uh, we basically conducted the experiment setup on the left and using with the, the human skull sample, um, we basically uh, excite the micro bubbles which basically uh, the, the stimulates the it stimulates the the brain veins uh, where the micro bubbles uh, circulated, and then uh, we receive it the CMATs, and the result of this uh, experiment showed that we can capture the micro bubble uh, emissions, which are the uh, the, the uh, crucial component of the, this this therapy, and we continue our experiment with um, the transmit experiment, uh, so. We can receive, but how about if, if we can transmit enough, uh, basically reach enough pressure? Although the uh, single CMOT can't generate enough pressure, uh, designing a multiple CMOT elements and then focusing them physically uh, can generate enough pressure to excite the micro bubbles in stable cavitation. And uh, this basically uh, checks two requirements of the blood brain barrier opening. The first one is the uh, sufficient pressure output, and the second one is the wise of operational frequency. And as a next step, um, um, I'm right now uh, modifying the, our current system for a small animal study. And, and uh, for this study, we are planning to use a rat animal model. And then uh, basically the goal of this uh, study will be to demonstrate if CMOTs can efficiently uh, deliver drug and then uh, non-invasively. <laughs> 
So um, let's take a moment to consider uh, what I'm trying to uh, achieve uh, in my you know, uh, research. Uh, you can just imagine a scenario, uh, a patient diagnosed with a brain tumor, uh, instead of going as surgery, which is a risky and a potential of um, and, and, and complications, uh, just uh, they need to do sit in a hospital room and then wearing a, a hemispherical shape of um, a CMAT a medical device. CMAT based medical device, and then uh, getting their um, the, the therapy, getting getting their uh, drug delivery in the brain, and and um, and you may think about that it's, it's probably not uh, it's, it's in a distant future, but actually it's it's, it's just uh, it's the scraps of uh, our uh, you know in our result of basically experiment will conclude that it's not in a distant future. But uh, we'll be conducting uh, this uh, therapy in a, a animal and human uh, studies soon. Thank you. Question I would like to take. Yeah, please go ahead. You said that this will be used on humans. So yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, doing a you know medical device and then saying it soon means in ten years, maybe fifteen years. Uh, yeah, it's 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 like soon enough, soon enough. Uh, I think the very critical point in this research, uh, like the finishing the animal study, you know, demonstrating that okay, this is feasible with uh, animals, and then uh, actually, uh, this is kind of out of context, but we have already a system for a uh, human study from the different uh, transducer technology. Uh, I mean, we are assuming that adapting the CMOT for that human scale system shouldn't be that hard. Uh, but like definitely, you know, we'll, we'll be seeing a lot of obstacles uh, throughout the, yeah, the human uh, experiments. Let's go ahead. It's vibrations like affect other parts of the brain. Is it said again? How do you like to, or do you, have you yeah. looked at how the vibrations? It's a great question. So the idea is that, uh, you know, I was mentioning that the targeted um, delivery. So the idea is that uh, we we focusing the the sound beams uh, with electrical delays. You know, uh, instead of uh, like the physical, uh, we also you know physically focus touch all elements. We also applying electronical delays, and those delays basically uh, uh, target the ultrasound beam certain region of the uh, you know in in the brain. Yeah, I mean there is more details actually. We have the uh, you know. Our biggest obstacle is skull. Skull is very attenuative, and also it, it aberrates the beam. But there are certain you know methods mm -hmm. uh, which can be applied to focus ultrasound beam uh, through actually the CT data. We first get the CT data, assume how the aberration will be, then we apply the delays and then focus the ultrasound beam on the targeted region. So you are focusing. So how long would it take for an animal? How, how long are your experiments? And yeah. do you have a problem with overheating? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, the focused ultrasound has a different application. One of them is the ablation. Uh, they basically ablate the tissue in the brain. Uh, for those cases, the heating is the issue. But for drug delivery, the pressure level on the uh, you know, uh, area shouldn't be that high. Uh, because you know that, uh, the low pressure requirement, uh, the heating is then not a problem, but for sure those ablation uh, studies they like apply the ultrasound wave for longer times and longer pressure uh, levels. It definitely uh, increases the in some hot spot on the skull. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. What type of role would you say you'd want for, uh, for a member of your team? So you are. Uh, I'm right now not sure if you are like hiring anyone, but um, I know our advisor always, you know, welcome the undergraduate students. Uh, actually, I am right now working with the one undergraduate students, and and I'm um, that like there are different roles. And for instance, uh, the one is the characterization characterization of the uh, sensors. You know, we uh, get them, and then we need to characterize them. The other role might be, you know, uh, doing the pressure scans. You know, okay, we are designing those, you know, elements. But how the the uh, you know the pressure field look like if, uh, if if the desired pressure you know will be achieved or not? This is a, a, another um, way of contributing this work. The another uh, maybe aspect is the simulation. You know, uh, we do a lot of acoustic simulation. Uh, we also do elastic simulation. 
I think these also parts uh, will be interesting for uh, undergraduate students. And finally, we have a big ultrasound system. Uh, it's the ultrasound research system. Uh, the coding that system will be another uh, you know, task for undergraduate students. This is what I actually, I currently work with, uh, the, the, as I mentioned, undergraduate student, and he's doing most of the, the, uh, that ultrasound system experiment. Um, I'm going to take our next presentation, but I want to take a 10 minute break. And so, if anybody wants to grab some, in the next 10 minutes, the next presentation starts at 555. That's the So, just leave one. Yeah. Uh, Okay, three more. Okay, like I I yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what else they did. They did the research. I don't know. This is the comparison between you and like your act. I cannot fully probably. Yeah. I 
You just copied the name of the employer bar that four I 
Let me get you some fun. All righty. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Everybody, let's take a seat. Great. Thank you. We're ready for the second half of this all exciting event. Um, a few updates. My grad students are very technically writing their email addresses on the board. So it's like if you want to contact them for future research endeavors, that would be a good way to do so. I'm going to open up the floor for coverage to come and present his evidence. Hey guys, uh, my name is Halim, and today I'll be talking about the Smart Data Center Network to accelerate latency crypto critical online services. So I'll start with the background on what I work on, and then we'll get into a little bit of the details of like my specific project. And hopefully, you guys can get a, a nice takeaway and So about me, um, I'm a fifth year PhD right now at ECE. I advise you, uh, Dr. Alex Lazarus, who's actually in computer science. Um, my research interest is in data science, cloud computing, and architecture. And what I'm going to be talking about today is accelerating late critical online services. So, if you don't know what a data center is, right? We often call a data center as the cloud. It's obviously somewhere out there, um, it's not in the sky or anything, it's, it's actually on. Um, it's, it's basically a warehouse scale building with thousands and thousands of servers that basically run online services. We serve web requests. And to give you a, a sense of how big these things are, they're typically integrated football fields. So, what you see at the top right is a, a, a Facebook data center that was built in 2021. Um, it cost $3.4 billion. It's and 27, and 27 million square feet, which is literally huge. And, what you see at the bottom is what it looks like inside. So there's racks of servers, um, and these servers are all connected with wires and switches and the data center interface. Um, and we actually have something like that in our campus. Uh, um, so basically, everything you send out on the internet usually goes through a data center in some shape. So if we go into the data center itself, uh, this is where the online services live. Uh, and we can take a social media service as an example, so something like Instagram. Um, Instagram actually decomposes its online service into thousands of what they call microservices. And the reason why they do that is because they want to be able to manage the complexity that comes along with developing um, such large scale application and also to enable scalability. So they want to scale certain bits and pieces of the application. So making it modular and uh, you know, decomposing it into microservices enables them to to uh, scale it. Uh, what you see on the right is a microservice graph, um, and we'll get into some examples of what these microservices are. Um, they basically show all the dependencies and all the thousands and thousands of microservices that are that run together and are dependent on one another in order to make the online service happen um, in the data center. So what, yeah, what I've shown here is a very uh, small model of what a microservice chain would look like in the cloud. So let's say you're on Instagram and you search Nike uh, and you want to find the Nike account. So your query ends up going to the search service, which uh, then fetches stats that you know, pertain to Nike's account. So the number of followers, the number of posts they've made. Uh, and then let's say you decide, you decide to follow Nike. So you follow Nike. Um, that triggers uh, other ML services, which then contribute to the ads and the recommendations that you would see if you're interested in, let's say, other brands, other types of shoes that, that you want to actually purchase in the future. Um, and the backbone of all of these services is a database. So obviously, there's uh, either memory or storage. In this case, we're talking about, about memory. Um, and the memory is essentially is, is an essential part of uh, making the microservices um, come to life because that's where all the data resides. Uh, and of course, at the end, there's there's a the response. There are tons of other microservices which you don't really care about. This is just to give you a sense of how big and important the problem is. And 
to, to elaborate more on that, the, the data center, the cloud providers uh, essentially serve millions and millions of these types of microservice requests every second. Uh, so it's really important to be able to process these requests in a very efficient uh, and, fast, as, and as fast as possible um, in order for, and we'll talk about, to improve the quality of service that they can provide to the clients and to generate revenue. So why is the performance of a microservice important? Right? It's a tiny fraction of what the entire uh, service looks like. So the processing overhead, like I mentioned earlier, can degrade uh, the quality of service. And the quality of service is twofold. So you can have the user, from the user's perspective, you care about lower latency, which gives you a better experience with the, with the service. Uh, from the cloud provider's perspective, all you care about is throughput, right? You care about how fast, um, you know, how many of these requests can I process in a very small or short, or short amount of time? And the more, the more you can do that, the more money you bring in. And that's really what the cloud provider uh, cares about. And so the way you do this is by uh, effectively, you know, highly utilizing all the servers that you have available to yourself in the data center. Um, so the goal here is to achieve the highest throughput uh, for the cloud provider while also reducing the latency for uh, and um, so we talked about how online services are decomposed into microservices. These microservices uh, are often distributed across several hierarchies in the, in the data center. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to be looking at these tier microservices. So things like databases, uh, data stores where you can write and retrieve uh, different kinds of information. Uh, and they're very latency critical. So these types of services that we're talking about, these database lookups, are often less than 10 microseconds long. Um, and they have uh, what's called strict tail latency SLOs. SLO stands for service level objective. It basically defines the latency requirement that the service has to provide. Uh, so, if, uh, for example, when you say uh, this microservice has a 99th percentile uh, latency SLO of 30 microseconds, that means 99% of the requests for this microservice have to complete within 30 microseconds. Um, and clients essentially purchase uh, different types of, it may more to get more uh, priority or better performance uh, from the cloud provider if that's what they want. Um, so a key performance determinant when handling millions and millions of these microservice requests on many core servers is how these requests are distributed across uh, the server cores. Um, and you can imagine that any sort of intercore load imbalance across these servers is going to lead to uh, a drop in peak throughput, right? It's, it's, it's kind of obvious. Like you can see there are some cores that are uh, shallow, some, some queues that are shallow, some cores that are pretty much idle, and other cores that are just hammered with requests. So that limits your peak throughput. It increases the queuing delay, as you can see with the, the red request at the, at the top queue, um, and increases tail lanes. So the takeaway here is, you know, you, you want to avoid load imbalance in your system uh, because that will lead to uh, increased throughput from your system. And then you can also reduce the tail latency, which is a win-win for both the cloud provider and the user. Um, so modern uh, servers typically use a mechanism that's built onto NICs. If you don't know what a NIC is, it's a network interface card. Uh, it's essentially the network interface that allows the server to communicate with other servers inside the data center. Um, and the mechanism that NICs, modern NICs uh, employ to do this load distribution or load balancing is called RSS or receive side scaling. Um, it's, it's a static mechanism, and this is mainly the drawback of uh, and where we, we try to come in with our, uh, our work. Um, it's a static mechanism that basically looks at the, um, the hash. It runs a hash function on all of the requests that enter the system and forwards requests from the same hash key to the same key. And so what ends up happening is you have an instance of, of load imbalance in your system. Again, some cores are idle, some cores are, are heavily loaded, um, and you have some problem with lots of queuing delay and the um, So what we look at here is offloading load balancing to programmable NIC. Programmable NICs have become more and more popular these days, um, especially NICs that have FPGAs on them. There's been a trend of offloading compute from yes. servers to, to the NICs to alleviate uh, processing burden from the load. And so um, the reason why this makes sense is because the FPGA can be is positioned neatly in the network where it can um, 
It's basically the entry and the exit point for all the requests that enter this uh, server. And so it's the ideal position to be able to perform any sort of uh, optimal load balancing. And the way we do this load balancing is 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 a is on a per request granularity where you can adapt to the real time load at each server. Um, and I'll explain uh, more about that. And the, really, the insight is that our microservices follow a response request response pattern, so you can easily track how many requests are pending in a, in a particular queue and monitor the outstanding work um, that resides in each queue and make your load balancing decision. Um, so here's a little bit of our, uh, of our, of our design. Um, we have two main policies that we look at. So this is a, mainly a hardware, uh, purely a hardware uh, mechanism. Uh, we have two policies that we uh, implement, joint shortest queue, which basically balances just the number of work items, and then there's joint lightest queue, which takes into account the service time of the different types of requests and queries um, that you decide to get. Um, and essentially what happens is you, the request enters the system, you parse the header of the request to make sure that it's something, a request that you're interested in uh, balancing. Uh, you find the lightest queue or the shortest queue in your system, you have PGA, you write that value in the request, so the request knows that it will get to go to queue uh, X, and you update the, pending, the state of pending work in that queue. You send the request to the cores, the cores process the, the request, they send it back on the way out, Again, you have this sort of ingress filtering where you know which queue it came from, and so you um, use the pattern where you and you sort of go from there. And because it's a hardware mechanism, we operate with uh, negligible performance. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm doing with time, but if I go too much over, you can just it's possibly, yeah, I guess I have time. I have like two slides left. So we basically implement this uh, on an actual system. We deploy it within a data center, and it actually runs across uh, different servers. So in this case, we have two servers. We have a client server that actually generates the load and measures the latency of these uh, types of requests. And then we have the server, which is running an, act, uh, an actual service, which is a, a key value store. It's a, it's a variant of a database lookup. And it gives you uh, the different query types that you would want to emulate different service time distributions. Uh, that you can expect to see in a real uh, in a real workload, and so what you care what we care to to look at here is basically uh, what which one of these policies is able to give us the, the most throughput uh, at the lowest latency. So what you're, the plots that you're seeing here are load latency plots. So um, there's uh, wait, so we're comparing the different policies. So the the, the, the yellow line is showing uh, a random distribution, which is emulating what a typical NIC would do. Uh, which obviously performs really bad because it basically distributes requests to the cores that are on a random uh, policy. Um, then there's round robin, which is another static policy that we look at. And then there's our two po dynamic policies. And uh, I guess uh, to, to cut it short, what we expect to see is our policies would work better. They would give us higher throughput and lower latency. Um, Essentially, you know, giving the allowing the, the cloud provider to operate at a higher throughput while delivering a lower uh, latency to the client. Um, and what we see is the maximum throughput that we that we are able to uh, improve over uh, our baseline is 95x. So we're able to improve the throughput that our system could deliver by up to 95x uh, for different types of uh, distributions. Uh, and we were able to operate at a peak a theoretical throughput of the system. So the line that you see, the dashed line is the peak uh, theor a theoretical throughput. Um, I'll end here, uh, and to, just to recap, uh, we uh, this is an example of what we, what the type of work that I do in my lab. So we, uh, I design systems for the data center, for the cloud. One of those systems uh, is uh, this load balancer, this dynamic uh, load balancer that we built on, on an FPGA for the actual data center. Uh, it basically adapts to the, the real-time load at each server queue and balances load on the curve of plus granularity uh, and improves the throughput of your system under very tight latency uh, requirements. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you have questions, you know, ask or come up to me or you can ask me. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Um, what type of softwares do you mainly use to develop your marketing? Is it like DHTL? 
or or very long or side things? Oh, but a good question. Yeah, I didn't go too much in the engineering, like the ECE stuff, which that maybe it should have been. Yeah, I use HLS actually, like a high level synthesis. Um, there's there's pros and cons. Like you get sometimes it gives you you know because you basically you write C and it gives you the RTL. Um, sometimes it gives you the performance not that you want. Sometimes it doesn't. It helps to sort of navigate. The, the RTL or injury parts can speak to the main block. But yeah, but what I use in this case is HMS. Gotcha. And okay. I noticed that you mainly use like get, but it's plus. Oh yeah. Also I've used like post or other types of HTTP requests uh within these microservices or is that not like a switch of a thing within yeah. So I, I think post is like a different, um, I guess so get put and scan are like the typical, like the most basic requests that you could have. Um, and it's specific, I, I, I think every sort of application has a different way of like representing it. I think post is probably a variant of, um, I think put maybe. Um, but yeah, but I guess like it really goes back to, but you could easily do the same thing with a different like database or different application, different network layer, application layer. Um, so yeah, but like the main thing here is really co-designing your hardware to, to, to work with the software. And that's really the, the most challenging part of this is really getting the, the software and the hardware to sort of work together to make, to make the system work. Did you have a question? Um, I don't know if not, uh, what do you call it, understanding this right, but wouldn't this increase the storage though if you're memorizing the path also via the cube and like when you're tracing it? Sorry, can you come again? Would it, which, would this, wouldn't this also increase storage or am I just like understanding it wrong? What, uh, what part of it would increase um, storage? When you were like tracing it like back like two, three slides. Here? Yeah, I think. The story. So, oh, so you mean like tracking, like the key, like the occupancy of the queues? Or yeah. Like how? Yeah, it, it takes up storage from like from the FPGA, and like it takes up a very small percentage. And I, I experiment, it's like three percent. Um, so it's it's a very small amount of like real estate that it takes up. Like, I just deleted afterwards. Or so, it, it, I mean, it depends. Like with FPGAs, you have to like sort of have a circuit there. And if you want to like have a different circuit that does something different, then you have to like uh, reprogram it. So you can have that as a part of a larger image, which does a variety of different things. But but yeah, but like you can't uh, you can't just remove it. Like you have to reprogram it, and that takes time. Yeah. So you mentioned about the the, the latency is kind of critical. Like you are looking on the order of like microseconds, and then I was wondering if you spend a lot of time you know, optimizing your code. Uh, does that really affect your latency? It does. It does. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot that goes into building a very optimized and efficient system. And uh, optimizing your code is one of the things that, one of the ways that you can go about um, doing this. Luckily, like a lot of the systems, especially that run in like modern data centers, a lot of the code, a lot of the software is already optimized. The network stack is already optimized. Uh, and so there's, it, it's sort of hard to, to, to show you know, what's wrong with the modern system. Um, you have everything so optimized in the cloud environment. But um, this is sort of a very sort of obvious thing where you could, you, know, you want to make better use of your, of your server and modern NICs don't do that. They have a different purpose. Um, and if anyone's interested, like I can talk more about that uh, offline. But for this purpose that we're that we're looking at for microservices, uh, it just turns out that this is not the optimal way, most optimal way of workouts. So we end up designing a very optimal way. Thank you. Yeah. 
Hello. Okay, how's it going? Great. Good. My name is Dan. I've been going to talk about some of my research today. I, the topic of today is strategic electric distribution network sets. So I work on power systems, I work on algorithms, power systems. So it's going to be a little bit uh, not tied to circuits, but I'm going to try and make it as fun and easy to understand as I can. Um, I'm a fourth year PhD student. Most of my work is in signal processing and like my primary focus is in power system and power system measurement data to be specific. Um, this problem I'm going to be talking about today is an issue with sensor networks and power systems. So it's, it's power systems are perhaps the largest network like that human, humans have ever designed, right? And we actually have a lot of sensors placed throughout it now, but we don't have enough computing power to process all of the measurement data that comes out of these devices. And so I'm going to talk about an algorithm that we're developing to try to effectively query the data that comes out of these measurement devices. So like the, the picture I want you to have in your head is there's just like this graph with a lot of nodes. We're gonna use this symbol N. So do I have a laser oh, man, that's so cool. All right, so we have a little symbol N here that tells you basically this is, these are all the nodes that we have in our network and we have all these sensors we can select. And we're only going to try, we're going to try and select as few as possible while trying to get as much information out of these that we can. And what exactly I mean by information, I'll explain in a second, but we want it, we want to have as many of these purple nodes as we possibly can. So we, we want to avoid pinging, as, we want to avoid pinging as many sensors as possible can while meeting some constraints. Does that make sense? All right, sweet. So by, by information, I specifically mean the worst case voltage at any of these nodes. So if we select this subset S of all of the nodes N, the information that we get out of that is, if you will, the maximum voltage observed in that subset. So that's, that's like the general gist of how I'm gonna measure how well this algorithm is performing. And this has a lot of applications, actually. So if you think about, like, let's say you live in a neighborhood and you were 30 years in the future, hopefully, and, you know, with policy changes to the point where anyone can interconnect solar PV on their rooftop and they don't have to talk to anyone, you can just plug it in and it's that simple. That can, that can sometimes lead to voltage problems for you and your neighbors and the grid operators might want to know where those voltage problems are happening. So they would be interested in this algorithm to try to isolate where the voltage problems could be without trying to ping every single sensor throughout the entire network. So that's the idea. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. I love seeing nods. <laughs> okay. So like the, the general idea I'm going to do some math here. So, so there's this, basically there's a power system mathematical model for the voltage magnitude as a function of power injections. And there's this special matrix that I'm not going to write out and we're just going to call it M. So the voltage magnitudes are this matrix times the power injections. And this is sometimes called Lin disk flow. There's a lot more going on here, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and I'm going to take this a step further and actually say, like, with some more math, you can actually come up with what's called the graph Fourier transform of the voltage magnitude. So there's this other really special matrix 
that you can multiply it's multiply by the, the Fourier transform coefficients of voltage magnitudes, and you can represent the voltage magnitude that way. Cool. Why does this matter? Uh, there's it's kind of complicated, but basically there's there's just like this really nice. I want you to believe me that there's this really nice algorithm that if you can write your signal as a graph Fourier transform representation, there's a really nice algorithm for sampling sensors with this information. So I'm just going to ask you to believe that for now. Um, there's a lot more details that we could talk about offline if you're interested in, but I just want to get to the, the the important stuff here, which is like what how, what what decision does this algorithm really make? And that's that's what this set captures. So it's like this set describes mathematically like the set of all subsets of your in your network that have no more than B members. So that's like what we're choosing from. We're trying to pick the best element of this set. And this is sometimes called an action set. Um, and b basically, there's a lot of possible strategies here. So it's, there's, it's, it's an incredibly complicated problem. Right? But there's a really nice algorithm. There's a really nice like class of algorithms for solving problems like this called bandit algorithms, which um, I will explain in a second. And the, the whole idea of a bandit algorithm is to maximize the reward of, of your choice from your action set. So you have this action set, you're trying to pick one action and maximize your reward. So in our case, the reward, if we go back here, would be the maximum voltage observed in your subset. So you have all of these nodes, you select the subset, and then you get the reward, which is the maximum voltage you've observed in that subset. So in our case, the reward is indeed this worst case voltage. And in symbols, it looks something like this. So we have this subset S and we have the maximum voltage observed in that subset as our reward. And as I mentioned before, uh, when you have this problem of like, okay, I have an action set, I have a reward and you want to find the best action to get the best reward that's called a banded algorithm and the way that you measure how well a banded algorithm does is with something called the regret and i don't know about you guys but i have a lot of regrets and <laughs> regret just like that just like it would be for you would be to basically say what's the best you could have done and track what you did so far and that is the regret of this algorithm and it it makes sense, right? And and this this is what you want to minimize. That's what the computer is going to try and minimize. Yes. Question. Oh, three minutes. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I'm basically done. So don't worry about this. There's an equation. It's stupid. It's just regression. I promise. <laughs> that's, that's, that's it. It's all. It's just regression. And like, there's there's this little fancy term here that's a little different from what if some of you have seen this kind of thing before. Um, it's this is what makes this special. This is called a regularization term. And in particular, it's called a spectral regularizer. So like question mark, question mark, what does it mean? It's basically just electrical distance. So it's taking the it's taking into account the fact that we're solving this in power system data. And it's going to promote selecting sensors that are electrically far away. So there's some tricky stuff with the power flow equations that goes into this, but there's some, you can read the paper if you're interested, but like basically you can show that that regularization term minimizes the regret, I promise. And, you, and there is a closed form solution. It's really cool. And, and this comes from linear algebra. You can essentially derive this and it's nice and clean and you can prove that it's correct. And the, what, what you end up seeing is, is like over time, this is our algorithm on the left. We do better than at, at catching the maximum voltages than you would have if you had not used our algorithm, if you had used like the basic formulation of taking things random. That's the key takeaway. It's a cool algorithm. It gets you a lot of really nice information about, again, where the worst case voltages are in a electric power network. All right, I think I'm out of time, but I have one minute. Okay, well, I basically got through everything. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah.
Yeah. So why is it important to know where like the maximum power, I guess, you know, is maximum voltage. Yeah. So, so like the example I gave earlier would be like, for instance, let's say that you live in a deregulated power system market, which is yeah, that's just a good example. And like, what, basically, let me let me backpedal. It, it, there's a lot of power system markets where you can integrate. You can just basically plug solar panels into your your home and and use that to power to power your own consumption, and then also you can export that out to the grid. That can lead to big changes in the voltages at your node, like your home, and then also other people's home. And so engineers sometimes want to be able to like see where those voltage violations are occurring because it can be on like it, it could be random essentially they don't know where it's going to happen ahead of time and by pinging these sensors in a strategic manner you're able to like you you would be able to avoid pinging everyone's house and using all these computational resources uh and uh, well, so are, are, is your question more like why is it bad to have a maximum voltage or what are some situations where it's open ended? I think that, that helps a lot, which you, which you said already. Okay. Yeah. All right. But you know, like if you have a really large voltage, basically you can cause like an outage in the worst case scenario or like uh, some sort of some sort of equipment to break. <laughs> yeah. Why do you even end up in situations where you have like spikes? Like why doesn't the yeah the equipment or whatever the technology is already like mitigated? Yeah, so sometimes it does. Sometimes it does mitigate that. Sometimes it, a lot of the times it doesn't because you'll you'll get in situations like um I don't know if you've heard of like the duck curve or it's like basically like when when people <clears throat> when people like come home at night, right? Like they're 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 like like from work. Actually, their electricity consumption dramatically spikes around like 6 p.m., uh, 7 p.m. And it, when everyone's doing that in tandem, it can need to, like, let's say everyone's trying to watch the Super Bowl or whatever. <laughs> and like, it, 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 said it, can, it can lead to a dramatic change in voltage all of a sudden at large subsets of nodes. Um, does that make sense? And it, like it, it's not always possible for the automatic control equipment to account for that. The long story short. That makes sense. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. So I thought it was more of a sensor towards like detection. Exactly. Yeah. Your type of algorithm which is more on like controlling it. Right, yeah. Yeah, that. Yeah, did, did you finish your question? There? Oh, yeah. There, there are algorithms for controlling it. Yeah. So, so you'll see those. There's a big literature on that. It's called like voltage control algorithms. Um, if you like if you look up papers that have that kind of title, you'll see a lot of people design algorithms that do exactly what you just suggested. Um, that's not really my area, but it is a very interesting and exciting area of research. Um, um it, no it's i mean it, it could be similar style but um in with a lot of the, that type of research you'll see people talking about power electronic devices and like different strategies to design control laws and stuff like that and it's, it's a really interesting area of research because if you like control theory it's very similar to that um yeah does that make sense that answer your question. Okay.
Hello. Good evening, everyone. I'm Bhispati, and today I will give you a brief overview of what I'm working on. I'm, uh, I'll present my work on brain-inspired spiking neural networks, which is considered as the next generation of neural networks and artificial intelligence. So I'm a fifth-year PhD candidate in the Green Lab, working with Professor Saibal Mukhopadhyay. So uh, in the beginning, I'll give a brief overview of what's the motivation of looking into this problem at all. So if you look into the last couple of years of AI development, like the models and the sizes of the models, then you see there is an, there has been an exponential growth in the number of computations needed to train such models, and similarly for inference. And these exponential growth in uh, computation uh, comes with a heavy cost in the training uh, training cost and the uh, uh, and the cost of computation, and that we see from the latest large language models and vision transformers like ChatGPT training costed around hundred million dollars in training and it costed around 1.287 gigawatt hours in energy. And that is a, a significant 300,000 times more power consumption than the state-of-the-art model that was there six years ago. And it's all good and uh, all until we want to deploy these AI models at the edge on, uh, on the devices, uh, in, like your smartphones or smart glasses or your smart watches, and because of these data-hungry uh, models. And that's why uh, we, uh, there was a uh, study that came out a couple of years ago where they uh, tried to run a retina net, which is a very old model, a small model, which uh, just uses 300 giga operations per inference. And they uh, implemented that on a smart glass and saw that it has a battery life of only around 64 minutes, which is not very good. And this is just using a retina net, and the current deep learning models, like the transformer models that we are using, use orders of magnitude higher computation than retina net. So it's just unaccept unacceptable if we want if we want to keep on doing that. So in order to fix this problem, uh, the people started coming up with this idea of how do we uh, uh, change the uh, current artificial neurons and the learning methods that we use from a continuous time uh, real valued uh, information transmission to a more uh, yeah, spike train based tra information transmission to something which more resembles the brain because the brain operates in a uh, human brain works at uh, like a 20 watt capacity and it's a uh, highly uh, generalizable highly scalable and we want to we took ideas from that and try to implement these uh, networks called spiking neural networks uh, which is the topic of my research so the Research in current research in uh, spiking neural networks have different levels. So there is a huge uh, uh, research direction on like uh, devices and how we use spintronic devices and memory structures and crossbar arrays and how they can be neuromimetic and uh, how they can be used to uh, uh, mimic these LIF neurons and the uh, neurons and synapses in, of the brain. There is uh, one level up on top of that which works on how to implement circuits based on that, how to uh, you do current injections and Schmidt triggers, and how they all come together to implement the LF neurons and the sleep dynamics. And on top of that is the algorithm side, where we use all these uh, mechanisms of neural and synaptic dynamics and the uh, uh, learning mechanisms to come up with an, a new algorithms of how do we leverage spike-based uh, trans information transmission, uh, spike-based information transmission for new kinds of computations that was otherwise not possible with current deep neural networks. And most of my re research is uh, around these algorithms and hardware software code design side. So uh, when we are discussing with algorithms, we have to first discuss about the architectures of the models. So first of all, we have, uh, so my research uh, area revolves around this uh, our, uh, architecture called the recurrent spiking neural network model which is an interconnected graph of excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And uh, essentially what it does is uh, we take, uh, given any input signal, it can be a spatial temporal signal, it can be a temporal signal. We have to first convert it into spikes uh, using this encoder layer. And this spike-based input is then fed into the RSNN layer, which is then decoded with the decoding layer. And finally, we have this readout layer, which does the computer, which does the task which we want to do. 
which can be temporal uh, prediction or classification or anything we want. So a key thing to note here is that the only training process is in the RSNN network and the readout layer. And the RSNN network, uh, the readout layer is the only place where we have a supervised uh, back, uh, back propagation based model because we need to learn the uh, uh, labels and all. But these RSNN network is trained with something called spike timing dependent plasticity, which is also inspired by how the brain learns. And essentially, people have come up with an ingenious ways of how to implement this on devices. And I use this uh, training method of uh, STDP of how we can leverage this plasticity models to make this RSN then learn. And how it works is it is based on this idea of Hadean plasticity, which is essentially if two neurons fire together, they wire together. And essentially, if we have the presynaptic neuron which fires before the postsynaptic neuron, then we strengthen that way. And if the presynaptic neuron fires after the postsynaptic neuron, then we uh, decrease the strength of that way. And this kind of plasticity is essentially useful because it is a continual learning mo model. Because uh, whenever the spikes come in, we continuously update the model, which is quite different from uh, what we do in DNN. And we'll talk about it in details later. So most of the research that I talked about till now is focused on the energy efficiency side of, uh, spike, of spiking neural networks, how, how this discrete spikes-based information transmission can greatly improve uh, energy efficiency. But my research also deals with what extra computational advantage can you get when you are using this spike-based communication, when you are uh, dealing with this event-based propagation, event-based computation. And I, uh, my research is uh, currently at the confluence of how we can leverage this, uh, leverage this temporal processing of the SNS with the uh, STDP-based plasticity models that we uh, just talked about, and how that combines with the energy efficiency to give us, uh, uh, and, uh, to give us uh, new dynamics and new learning paradigms that was otherwise not possible with deep neural networks. So for the temporal processing part, which is the first part that I will talk about, uh, we have this uh, two different domains of information coming. One is the, uh, the, uh, uh, one is the event camera, which is quite different from the RGB-based cameras that we normally deal with. Uh, instead of, uh, the, while the RGB-based cameras deal with frames per second, where every instant is captured as a frame, and we keep on uh, uh, propagating the frames, the event-based camera only propagates events. So essentially, there is an event only when there is a change in the, uh, in the frames. And uh, why this is very useful is because when we have fast-moving objects, this event-based camera outputs can uh, uh, help us reduce the, help us actually eliminate this uh, motion blur kind of scenario. So suppose if this thing is moving very fast and the standard camera output will only capture certain uh, time instance of this and try to, and we are trying to understand that. But even this camera is a continual, uh, is a continuous stream of events because it's uh, getting the uh, difference in each of these frames. The other point of, uh, other form of, uh, in the data that we process that we use are the temporal point processes where we have discrete events coming in from uh, from maybe a gra graph graphical network or something like that and we want to predict what's the next probable event and when the next event is going to happen so this is to note here that current deep learning models that we have the deep neural network are not capable of to uh, use uh, to perform well on these kind of event based sparse asynchronous event data and uh, that's why the spiking neural networks are absolutely essential to you know, for these kind of uh, data the next point is when we are using this notion of spike timing dependent plasticity that i talked about and the online learning behavior that comes with it so essentially if we know if we see the conventional ai mechanisms we see that uh, with time, the, uh, the uh, conventional AI loses its uh, performance because, because something uh, which is called as plasticity loss. Because And the retraining these models are extremely difficult because we need another whole set of data sets. And again, retraining and again, this energy, uh, energy costs come in. Uh, we, with these notions like SCDP, uh, we have this continuous learning uh, notions because it is continually updating the weights based on the spike timings. And this spike timing based weight updates can help us uh, um, mitigate this uh, uh, loss, loss of plasticity that we see with conventional AI models. And that's what we, uh, we look into when, use, when using this RSNN with STDP models that we uh, discussed earlier. The third and the final point that I work on 
is the sparsity and the asynchronous processing of events. Because since the events are, since the spiking neural networks works uh, processes uh, by events and not the continuous values, these can be uh, extremely sparse. And since it is sparse, it is highly scalable and can be used for very large models. And uh, this kind of models are essential to uh, essentially uh, scale up the models uh, to large, uh, large, uh, large scales so that we have better performing performing models than current DNNs. So, in conclusion, we have these three fronts of research. Uh, the energy efficiency is, of course, the main uh, center of attention where we use this uh, devices and the circuits uh, to uh, make this uh, uh, make this SNN model extremely energy efficient, so so, so that we can deploy uh, uh, deploy them on the edge. And then, on the other hand, we can leverage this spike-based communication uh, between the neurons to do the temporal processing and the plasticity, so that it can uh, adapt continually to changing environments. And it has huge applications in edge intelligence and online learning and low power computing. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Questions? Question. So um, you mentioned about some application and also you, you know, uh, something like your, your uh, model. Uh, I was just curious if you have any specific application you are targeting or you just do the model based uh, research. So there are like uh, each of them have like different kinds of applications we're targeting. So when we are looking into suppose even this camera, uh, even this camera, we have this notion of spare action recognition task that we want to solve. Uh, then uh, we uh, like for this we are solving some kind of reinforcement, reinforcement, reinforcement learning problems. Essentially, we are trying to see whether these uh, models can adapt to uh, changing environments. Then we are also seeing into like large scale graph neural network models because like uh, when we are talking about the sparsity and asynchronous processing, we looked into extremely large scale with like million nodes of graphs and these no, uh, these extremely large scale dense graphs are difficult to process by graph neural networks or stuff like that. And we need some kind of asynchronous processing of the events uh, and that's where the spiking neural network ne networks come in. Can work all these applications at the same time? Yeah, so there, there are different projects I'm working on. So, uh, so for this, is like are you simulating this or is it actual hardware? That's a good question. So most of the algorithm, the high-level algorithm, are simulations. But we also have cryogenic hardware we are building right now. Uh, we have someone who is uh, doing uh, like implementing those on FPGA and seeing how it performs. We also have uh, worked closely with Intel and uh, like uh, do this uh, like uh, uh, simulations on their low heat chips. So yeah, it's uh, up to you what you want to do. So another follow up question. So what is the precision that you deal with when you are making a hardware? Right? So mostly I'm dealing with the FP16, uh, protein by 16. But uh, uh, so it's the quantization and precision depends on how fast you want to do. And this is the trade off you want. You are doing. like the precision and accuracy is the uh, like what you want. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so um, so that's the final yeah, six presentations, and I'm going to give a judge a couple of minutes uh, to put their toys together and in the uh, five minutes to come up here and announce the winner or else. In the meantime, a couple of announcements. Um, a lot of the undergrads have expressed interest in joining, or why not of the grad students as well? Are free to reach out to them. A couple of them are written their email addresses on the board. If you want to put that down or uh, walk up to them, speak to them personally, that would be great. We also have more food, and so if you want some of it, you can take it on your way out. Um, yeah, so no, no, uh, I Give us a, give you a couple of a couple more minutes. Okay. <laughs> well, if that's the case, I'm going to also present my research. <laughs> um, I work with Dr. Daniel Mozan. I do power systems optimization. I actually work closely with two people over here, Sam and Amanda, and so living, I could use their slides. Um, <laughs> um yeah. I don't know, anybody have any thoughts, opinions on what we've done today, maybe for next year? Because we sort of conceived the idea and we're like, oh my God, 
It's a brilliant idea. But that's just us thinking and talking. So if anybody has any opinions, something that you think we could do, maybe to make it better. Yes. Lecture series. A lecture series. I mean, there's, you can get a lot out of like these presentations, but like maybe not go as much depth. So too many lecture series will again allow you to for people who are more interested in like learning more in the okay. area. Yeah, maybe to look so that but you know like senior students to like have a series of students. Right. So have like graduate students yeah. give lectures like once a month kind of thing. Yeah, like the Institute of Electron like the Nano Electronics Institute does that with professors. Okay. So it's like a, a monthly talk, it's recorded, they have to show up and they lecture. Okay. Yeah. So I think it'd be cool to get that experience. Okay. So like so you're, you're adding to that. You're adding to it, like, not just the professors, but you want grad students to also have, okay, so, like, next semester, we're opening it up that any grad student who wants to give a talk, we have, like, five slots in the course of the semester. Anybody, something like that? That's, that's not too much. Yeah, but yeah, anybody? <laughs> okay. Yes, talk to me. What about, like, YouTube videos? YouTube videos. Of, like, of all the presentations. Like, Two days presentations. Yeah. And then, like, so people who didn't want to do that. Right. You later on, unless you graduate. I see. How do you see YouTube channel? Okay, that's a good point. Uh, we don't have a GSO page, but we could definitely speak to like um, like um, like actual EC to put it up somewhere. Maybe like feature this in the. So that's something we can definitely work on. I like that. That's good. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> Ready. Okay, they are ready. Great. So, the moment of truth. Yes. Can, should we stand up? I mean, that'll be great. Just to up the tension. Well, first, I want to say these are all really great presentations, and I don't know about you guys, but I learned a lot. My research was in optics, so definitely not related to all of this. So, thank you so much for presenting for all of us in the first place. Um, I think you all had great presentations. And if you want to hear the feedback, maybe talk to us later. I'm happy to share it later. But um, I'd like to say congratulations to Vishwa Deep. Uh, you are our winner. Great. So if you encourage me and raise a kindly jump up, can we come join us? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just a quick picture. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. We also invite the rest of the presenters. Please come and join us as well. Thank you all for coming and participating. <laughs> I think it would six hours. I would actually Thank you. 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 Thank you.